Lou Zatorski, please come up. Thank you, thank you. And what it's what is this your first time in Atlanta? Yes, it is. Yes. Oh, wow, that's loud. <laughs> yes, it is. This is a, a man, as uh, I think some of you now know, uh, grew up in an Orthodox city community in Brooklyn, and uh, and didn't see a movie until he was quite uh, advanced in years, and no television, and no radio, and no great amount of traveling. And uh, all of a sudden, because of this film, you've been traveling all over the United States and a little bit to Europe, I think. Yeah, but before we begin, I just want to say one thing. There is a red Acura in the parking lot <laughs> with a bumper sticker that says, I love Yiddish. And I have reason to believe that the owner of that car is in the audience here. Is she here? Is she here? Is she here? Are they here? They already left. All right. I just assume that they're here. But the... Uh, and and obviously grew up speaking nothing but Yiddish yeah. until you were how old? Um, I mean, I started learning, like, teaching myself proper English, like, in my early 20s. In your early 20s. Yeah. Wow. Not that long. Well, maybe, like, the... Do I have to tell you how old I am? No, like, like nine years ago, I'd say, approximately. Yeah. And what was the major tool for learning English? A lot of NPR. <laughs> a lot of NPR and watching every movie with subtitles. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, you are so fortunate, and I think I, I think you know that, to be in a film this good so early in a career with such a strong role. I'm very, I got very, very lucky. And, um, you know, it's a... Uh, you know, I, I live in LA now, so I'm surrounded by a lot of actors all the time. Most of my best friends are actors, and they work so hard. They put in so many years trying to get something going. And, uh, you know, and I, I know I got lucky. I mean, I've been doing this for eight years now. So, you know, I've been trying to get where I am for quite some time. And, uh, you know, and I've paid quite, you know, a price for it. But, uh, you I paid I got, your dues. I, I, yeah, I think so. But I, I got lucky. You know, I got lucky, and uh, it just. I mean, I, I don't think there's much else to it. I don't think this audience realizes that when they first conceived of this film, it was thought of and started off as a comedy. Isn't that correct? That's correct. <laughs> that, yeah. Well, the, the way the way it is is that the uh, Maxime, the director, and his co-writer um, Alexander and Martin, who plays Felix, have been best friends for a very long time. And Martin has done a lot of movies in Quebec. He's very well known in Quebec. Uh, but he always does like very serious and and kind of like screwed up characters, and he's all, but in person he's a really really funny guy. He's really goofy. He's a musician. He's just he's crazy kind of in a way, but in a very charming way. And he's never done anything funny, so they decide they're gonna write a script for him, where he can star in and and show off his comedic side. But the more they started researching the subject of someone leaving the city community, the more they realized that this is not a laughing matter. You know, the people who leave, they give up a lot, and it's a very difficult uh, um, thing to do. So as the script kept getting revised, it got more and more serious. And by the end of it, there you go, Martin again, playing a very serious character. <laughs> well, I think his character is not very serious. His character is actually kind of like uh, freewheeling around uh, in life. But um, but it's still it's not a, it's not necessarily a comedic character. The, the thing about community, and we see it in a lot of the films we screen here, is that you know community can be supportive, can be defining, uh, can be um, informing, and 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 all, all these positive things. But it also can be oppressive and. Uh, and especially if it's a very tight community, uh, it can shun. And your leaving your community was not easy. Um, no, I think it's every. Uh, I don't think it's uh, it's un, uh, unfair to characterize the Hasidic community, at least in the iteration that I grew up in, as somewhat of a cult. Um, I'm sorry. It is. Um, um, sophomore, you know. So. Yes, I mean, of course, there are positive sides. Everything there's positive side. There's 
politicized to Scientology and to Mormonism and to all kinds of fundamentalist religions. There's having a support of people very close to you all the time. You can't go hungry in the Hasidic community. Uh, there are no kids without shoes. Um, the chances of you dying from a heart attack are way smaller. They have their volunteer ambulance services called Hatsala. Uh, who's my, by the way, if you call the EMS anywhere in any big city, and especially in New York City, they say the response time is about 12 to 15 minutes. Hatsala will get to your house. And the second you hang up the phone, they'll be there in less than three minutes response time. Less than three minutes. So, which is a major, makes a huge difference you're having a heart attack, you know? So yes, there are all these great things, there's all these organizations and help, but it comes at a price of, of personal freedom and, and, and personal expression. And I know that personal expression and freedom and, and, and those things are not as important as water in Africa, but, uh, but it's important. We live in America and we should be able to, to enjoy everything America has to offer, or any democracy or any free country. And uh, I think taking that away from kids, and taking away bacon from kids, I mean, who does that? <laughs> you know? It's, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you decided, um, I mean, you were married, right? Yes, yes. And you, you decided to leave the community at the age of about 20, 19? 20, 22. 22. And I, somewhere I read that, that it felt a lot like being, having lived your life and grown up in a basement and all of a sudden being pulled out of that world and taken and abandoned at Grand Central Station. Yeah, yeah, it, that, that's what it felt like to me because I, I'm, a, I'm in a way in a foreign country, even though I grew up in New York City. Uh, I grew up like, what, eight miles from, from, from t Times Square and I've, I haven't seen I haven't seen anything um, New York City has to offer. Um, it's 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 like a, it's like being an immigrant in your own country. Uh, you don't have it. You don't have any friends outside the community. Um, you don't speak the language. Um, even if you do speak a little bit of English, you know you you know you start having conversations with people and they start making cultural references and you have no idea what they're talking about. You know I was actually I was working at this uh, for this men's clothing designer who makes all my clothes by the way um, his name is Duncan Quinn you should check him out um, and he has a lot of celebrity clients and he would always assign them to me because the one thing celebrities hate is being treated like a celebrity and the good thing is I would have no idea who they are <laughs> you know and like LeBron James I made it I made it talk for LeBron James and I and I, I I knew he was some sort of athlete so and I assumed that he's black he's big probably football so I just started asking him about football <laughs> and he like looks at me and is like what in, why would I know you know like, I don't know anything about football so you know I've, I've had Sean Lennon in you know in there and we talked for like two hours about Eastern religion and everything and I had no idea who he was because I've never seen a picture of John Lennon I didn't know who John what John he looks exactly like his dad but I've never seen his dad. I've never seen a picture of his dad. So uh, yeah, so you miss you miss the, you have huge gaps in everything. So, in, you, uh, so you come out at twenty two, and and have some inkling, I guess, that you would like to be an actor. Or, yeah. So you knew that when you came out, and with no cultural reference, with very few cultural references, at least that are going to fit into films other than this one. Yeah. And, so how do you start? What I mean, that that is like being abandoned in Grand Central Station. What do you got? What do you reach out? What do you grab a hold I, of? I had no idea what I was doing, and I remember like all of my friends were telling me, "You are batshit insane." You, like, how are you gonna do it? Do you have any idea how many actors go out there who did grow up in the secular world and do know about movies and do have a process and they still don't make it? You know, which is another phrase I don't like. Make it. What's making it? I mean, I don't know what it means. But, uh, uh, and they all told me I'm crazy. And I started out like looking on just on Google, you know, acting, you know, and I just, like literally I ended up on some, some of these scam websites that charge you like $400 to submit you to cast the directors. And of course that didn't work. I, I found like, a, I found gigs on Craigslist. The first film I ever did was, was a gig I found on Craigslist. Um, and then I found out that these casting, like real casting websites, like Actors Access and 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 casting networks, and uh, excuse me. And I would I would submit myself on there, 
And you know, one thing led to the other. I know I had a couple of credits, and then I ended up doing a short film, Where is Joel Baum? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about 2012 now, so it was, you know, it was quite a bit into the journey. Um, and that got that got into a couple of festivals. And one of the festivals I got into was a, a women's festival in uh, Montreal, where they promote uh, female filmmakers. And that film was directed by Pro Gluck. Um, so Nancy, who's one of the producers of this film, and one of the producers of Mommy as well, it was the same production company that produced both at the same time. She went to that festival to support female filmmakers or look for female talent, and she saw that film, and she was working on the script of Felix Mir at the time. So, but she couldn't she couldn't find my agent because I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she reached out to me on Facebook, and uh, and she offered to meet with me on Facebook, and uh, we met in New York. And uh, long long story short, and a couple of weeks later, I had the part. I, we did an audition, the taping, and. And that was it, yeah. Uh, I'm blown away because I know something about this world, and to make that kind of transition, mm -hmm. in, 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 and you're dealing with the language issue also, not just cultural references, yeah. but they have to, but relearning the language, and then the craft. Um, you're one determined young man. Uh, I'm stubborn. Say. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, like, you know, I'm still Jewish. I'm still very stubborn. <laughs> um, but I should point out there's an organization in New York um, called Footsteps. That is that it, their their entire mission is to help people who leave the ultra orthodox communities transition into the outside world. And without them, I could have never have done it. Um, I was homeless when I left. They provided me housing and food and. Uh, they have all kinds of programs like um, uh, um, college, uh, um, um, uh, what do you call them? Scholarships uh, and just all kinds of programs like teaching teaching these people about like these people teaching us about you know sex and like how to date and how to you know where to eat how to eat and just everything about the world that we have no idea and it's an incredible organization and they helped me a lot without them I could have I could have never gotten this far there's no chance I mean they literally saved my life. So, if you have any extra money before you file your taxes, you divide them in half. Half you give to the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, and the other half you give to Footsteps. You know? If you want to see more films like this. I think um, one of the things I really respected in this film is, and I mentioned this in my introduction, is that, that in, in, in so many films and in so many plays, uh, when it gets to the really, you know, arch conservative, acidic communities, it's because there's almost nobody in there who's making the films, who's talking to them. It, it's almost cartoonish. This one, you, the, the character you play, uh, you can see the human soul. You can see the stuff. And that, that last scene we just sort of saw with falling onto the floor yeah. and music, and it, it, it is. I mean, there's all the sternness, there's all the closeness, the tightness, and yet there is this humanity that you let show through. I, I, I should point out that, you know, like, um, the Hasidic community is like every other community in the world. There's all kinds of people there. There are stringent, tightness, happy people, um, and that kind of people. There's happy-go-lucky people. You know, there's all kinds of people. Um, for dramatic purposes, for film, you know, it's always better to show that side rather than the than when than the happy go lucky because you know people aren't necessarily interested in seeing regular people do regular things. It's not a movie, you know, it's great, you know, for your friends, but you don't want to you don't want to see you don't want to go see your daily life in film. You want to see you want to see some drama. Um, so there's a lot of diversity and and I think what you said about the cartoonish thing is that no one is actually familiar with these people. The people who make movies about the city just don't actually know the people. And to me, one of the reasons I decided to become an actor was because when I started watching films, and I started watching films because the characters, they all talk like this, you know what I mean? <laughs> and if you go to Brooklyn, or if you go anywhere Hasidic Jews live, nobody fucking talks like that, <laughs> all right? Unless you go to the Yiddish theater, where you find, you, you find, you find people who are 115 years old, and they still talk like, toilet, toilet street, I'm gonna go down. Nobody talks like that. So it's a complete, completely inaccurate portrayal of what life is really like in the Hasidic community, and I, I made a, I made a, I made a strong point about bringing the reality and bringing a real 
Hasidic character, a contemporary Hasidic character, and, and put it in a film. And that's why all the, the Yiddish always needs films, like Holy Rollers, A Price Above Rubies, I mean, you name it, the Yiddish is all completely fucked up. You know, it sounds like some mashup of German and Fiddler on the Roof. And it's, it's, it's just, and to me it was very important for the Yiddish to be a real, you know, Hasidic Yiddish. Not Yiddish is Yiddish, and not some kind of cartoonish um, thing about it. I don't know if that answers the question, but the, I tend to go on rants when people bring up that issue. Um, but, uh, I wanted it to come in action because I wanted to see... It really wasn't a question, it was a compliment. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to open it up to uh, the audience if there are questions. Uh, maybe I'll ask one short one, longer, but you hold up your hand, you'll come with a microphone, and... Um, and ask your question. It should be Loser, a question. Why do you swear so much? It should be because a question. I get to. <laughs> Not a statement. Um, all right. And by the way, you do have a film that is in post production or all yes. shot? Yes. Uh, it's all shot. It's post production called The Turnout. Also directed by Pearl Glock, who directed the words Joe Baum, the short film. And I play a uh, method, a junkie. And, uh, not a Hasidic one, just a just a regular regular ass junkie. Yeah. <laughs> and when do you hope it comes out? We well, you know. Don't I, mean, know uh, I think they're trying to raise money for post production. Post production. Right now. Yeah. Okay. Shelton, uh, do we have, we have one right over here? Right. You said you were raised in the Setmar sect of Judaism. Yes, correct. Do they not believe in the state of Israel as a Jewish state? Uh, they don't. Yeah, that's correct. That those are that that's the one, yeah. <laughs> I was just in Israel. I love it. Shelton, there's one over here. Over here. Okay. You're first. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was wondering, you left the community and the tradition, and the culture. Did you leave the Judaic and the spiritual aspect behind as well? Um, I left the belief system behind. You know, there's a saying: you can take the you can take the boy out of yeshiva, you can't take the yeshiva out of the boy. You know, um, I still enjoy I still enjoy a good play of chant. You know, and I still enjoy a good a good uh, a good chabad niven. You know, I enjoy the music, I enjoy parts of it, and you know, 22 years of indoctrination. And it's not necessarily indoctrination, but of living in a living in a certain world, you don't just erase that overnight. So it still resonates with me very much. I love the music. I listen to the Hasidic music all the time, you know. And when I get a little bored, I switch back to Lady Gaga. No, I'm kidding. I listen to the Kings. <laughs> I listen to the Kings most of the time. Okay, good. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not. I don't consider myself a spiritual person at all. I, I'm I'm certainly not religious. Um, I certainly don't follow the rules of Judaism or of any religion. Uh, I barely follow the American laws. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I don't know, I hope that answers the question. I sped here. I was speeding here. Two questions. One, do you see your family at all anymore? And two, I, getting back to the movie, um, I know as with any religion that's very orthodox, so if there's a huge difference in living for the women as opposed to the men. And I also noticed that I don't know how she would have gotten out and managed if she hadn't met someone who had money and could, she went right into being taken care of again. Um, the, it just seems like it's always worse for the women or more, a m much more narrow lifestyle for the women. Yes, I would. Uh, um, the first question is whether I, split, uh, I still speak to my family. Um, part of them I do. I have 11 siblings, and I speak to half of them, which is more siblings than a person needs. You know, it's way too many siblings. Um, and some of them, I, some of them don't speak to me by choice because they disapprove of my lifestyle. And uh, the other ones are so young they don't even know me because I was out of the house by the time they were born, and so we don't really know each other. Um, so I speak to half my siblings. Me and my parents didn't speak for many years. We didn't speak for about seven years, uh, but we kind of reconciled. We reconciled about a year ago. I'd say last June, um, we sort of came together. We talk on the phone occasionally. We try not to avoid the sore subjects. So I actually had like half an hour conversation with my dad on the phone, arguing whether Fairfax runs east to west or north to south, uh, just to talk about something. Um, 
And the other, uh, and the, the second question is, it's definitely a lot more difficult for women um, to leave because they have a lot less freedom than men. And, and there are a lot, a lot less women leave for that reason. And those who do have an incredibly difficult time. And I know I've said this before, and I don't want to get really like touch on sad subjects, but the sad fact is that about every six months, and we have a pretty large community of ex Hasidic Jews in Brooklyn, about every six months, one of us commits suicide just because they can't handle it. And it's more amongst women than men because they, they get their children taken away from them. Um, they, they just can't fight the fight and they have no tools to cope in the secular world and they just give up and they're like, there's no way, I don't want to go back to that community because that's not where I belong and, and I can't survive in the secular world, so they just fuck off, you know? Oh, that's a harsh way to say it, I shouldn't say it that way. There you go, immediately punished. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's very, it's very difficult um, for them. And anyway, enough with the sense. I've got one more uh, question over here. And then As a male, did you course. need a get? Yes, I did need a get. You did. The, male, the, the, the man has to give the get. I know. Always, so, yeah. Uh, uh, your wife has nothing to say about it, is that correct? Well, she just had to ask for it. I see. And, and you and you were done gladly. I got you. <laughs> And when you were talking about that no one likes um, movies that where everything is ordinary, you can imagine the title, Get the Trial That Ends yeah. Happily. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the time when you actually left the community. When did it first occur to you that you were going to leave? And then if you, can you describe that if it's not secret, the moment when you were leaving? Um, I, I, I think it was a gradual process for me, um, slowly realizing that I don't belong. When I was a teenager, I always had questions, uh, mostly philosophical questions, like I think questions that the, everybody asks themselves, you know, where, where do we come from, why are we here, you know, what's the meaning of life? And I was just unsatisfied by the answers I was getting, but at a certain point I put that aside and decided to just go with it. And I went with it for quite some time, I had an arranged marriage, I got married, and after I got married, then I gained some freedom to basically, because you have no freedom before you're married. You live in your parents' house and you yeshiva. it. Once you're married, funny enough, the men get some freedom. They get to do their own thing. So I started exploring, I started doing some research, and uh, someone basically told me about the theory of evolution. I'd never heard of it before. And I started reading on it, and I started doing some research. So I would say it was some sort of combination of like, of uh, Charles Darwin, um, National Geographic, Christopher Hitchens, and George Carlin, that kind of like <laughs> made me go like, yeah, this is bullshit. Um, so, but I didn't like, I didn't, I wasn't planning on fully leaving until, until uh, um, uh, my wife asked me for a divorce, because she was actually, she said to me that, you know, whatever you do outside of the house, you know, I don't approve of it, but whatever you do, you do. When you're in our house, you have to behave um, in a certain way, and I, and I lived like that, and she thought it was gonna be, it was a phase that I was gonna get over. And when she realized that it's not ending, that I just don't wanna be religious, um, she asked me for a get, and that's when I, and, and I gave her a get, and as soon as I gave her a get, and, and word got out, because my father's a, a pretty prominent uh, Rebbe in the city community, so word got, out, got around pretty quickly why we got divorced, and I was immediately thrown out of my apartment, I got fired from my job, I. So within like a couple of days, I, I had nowhere to go. I was, and I was automatically out. It's not like I was, I had to leave. I was automatically just out. Um, and yeah, and then I started figuring it out uh, as I went along. And uh, I still, you know, I mean, no one has, has life figured out, um, but I, you know, I think I uh, kind of getting an idea of where I'm going, you know? I think we've been very fortunate, one, to get to see this film, because I think it is a very, very fine film, but also to get to spend some time with you and to you. hear the story, which, which is amazing to me. It's absolutely amazing. Thank, thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And